Okay. Hello, my friends and new listeners. Welcome to Yoga Talks Podcast. My name is Jay Brown. Thank you for listening. It's a big day for the podcast. For me, I'm talking to my most influential teacher, Mark Whitwell. And I have to admit that this was a challenging episode for me when I first decided to do the podcast. I made a list of people, like an initial list of people that I thought would be on would be on the podcast and, and Mark was on that list and I've long since had everybody else who was on the list here to talk, but I hadn't done it with Mark. And I think it was because I was nervous. Um, I was nervous for maybe two reasons. I was nervous, one, because I felt like I needed to knew what, know what I was doing with the podcast more before I could really have him on and feel secure enough in what I was doing for it to be good. And the other thing that I think was making me hesitant is because I've known Mark for a lot of years, 15 plus years, and in that time, we've talked. We've talked on a personal level and a professional level. It felt um, awkward to me that he would come on the podcast and we would, I don't know, recycle some kind of conversation that we've already had, which I think is a pot, it would be a risk that I would take in having him on because it's very easy for us to just kind of drop into some of our, our canned stuff. Like all yoga teachers have canned stuff. I mean, if you, if you watch enough of them on YouTube or whatever, you'll see everybody's got material that they use. And my whole thing with this podcast has been, I don't, I don't want to have that stock question and answer where I turn to the guest and I say, what is yoga? And they give me their stock answer. I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that. Definitely not with Mark. So I just, I wasn't sure what to talk to him about. I didn't know how to, I didn't know if I was going to be able to do what I want to do with this podcast with Mark. So I just avoided it. Just sometimes when I do, I'll avoid something for a while. And I, at a certain point though, it started to feel not cool that I wasn't having him on. Like I've had all these people on the podcast. Why haven't I had Mark on? And I just felt like, oh, get over yourself, man. It's just Mark. Just get him on the podcast and talk to him, you know? So I did. So we nailed down some time and it was a little challenging in that he's traveling and he's in different time zones. And then when we did finally nail it down, he was in Australia So the phone connection was a little bit shoddy to start. It was a little bit of a delay, but it got better. It got fine. And I think the conversation was fine, even though we were talking at such long distance, which is something that's been happening more with the podcast where I originally wanted to only have conversations with people in person, but it just wasn't logistically possible. So I've been doing the calls. I think they've still been happening good. I'm, I'm still enjoying them, even though I'm not in the room with them. Although I do wish I could have been in the room with Mark. I think it would have been a different situation. But it's, I don't mean to belitter it. I, I'm really happy with the way the talk happened. That's really what I want to say is that it's a big day for me because I think I managed to have a conversation with Mark that I've never had with him before. And that was my goal. I, just, I didn't want to talk about all the stuff that we've, we've already talked about. I wanted to see if we could find a more novel conversation between us, which as I said, isn't easy when you know somebody for so long, but we, I managed to do it. I'm excited. It's a cool conversation. It's, it's very dear to me, um, that it happened and I'm excited to share it with you. And I imagine that there's a lot of people who might be listening for the first time who are maybe listening just because Mark's on. And I guess I wanted to say all that just so you have some sense if you haven't listened to this podcast before, that I'm really not trying to, you know, get Mark to give us all of his yogic wisdom in this talk. I, we get, we get, we definitely get some yogic wisdom, I think. But the the idea was to have a, a real conversation that 
that isn't just about us teaching, you know, like we both teach and you can go to Mark's workshops and you can see him online. I wanted to have um, the conversation that we haven't heard before. So you get to, you, you'll see how I did. You'll see how I did. Um, what else? Today is also uh, the month anniversary since the new online workshop, Gentle is the New Advanced, uh, went out. And I've been getting feedback from people who've been completing it. And it seems like it's going over pretty good. I'm happy for that. And I wanted to give a little something back to the podcast listeners. Those of you who've been listening the last two weeks and the love fest that's been happening with me and those of you who are listening to this podcast continued this week where so many of you sent me notes and they were just so wonderful. I really, I'm just loving you guys and this podcast and Mark's on today. And so I talked to my producer earlier and I said, Hey man, let's do something. Let's do something that we haven't done on the podcast before. And he said, well, let's just give everybody a little bit of a special gift, a special gift to the listeners of this podcast. So anyone who happens to be listening to this, if you go to jbrownyogavideo.com and you enter promo code Mark15, M-A-R-K-15, you'll get 15% off anything that you purchase, the, the practice DVD and downloads or the workshop course. Um, you can buy more than one. You can buy gifts for people, whatever you want. Uh, put in that promo code MARK15 and you get 15% off. So there you go. There's a little something just exclusive for podcast listeners and I really am so appreciative, you guys. It's just so lovely to feel supported. And um, thank you guys so much. So um, that's it. I'm not going to talk anymore. I'm just going to get to the conversation that I had with my friend and teacher, Mark Whitwell. So uh, here we go. Here we are, my friend. We were just saying before we ran into the initial technical difficulties, got them sorted out, that um, it's not so easy for us to uh, get get in touch with each other. And, and I was admitting that part of it's just me, that I'm terrible about being in touch with people, particularly by the phone. Yeah. And that the podcast has become this like good excuse for me to have conversations with people that yeah. I'm ca- I care about her in my life. And so... I'm glad to finally get you down, and and you you said you were in Australia, right? Yeah. You're in Sydney, Australia, and it's bright and sunny there. Yeah, I come down here once a year. It is sure is bright and sunny, and uh, the glare of the you know no ozone in the sky. It's very bright. A lot of skin cancer down. A lot of skin cancer in in Australia. Wow. Yeah, I, well, I know what you mean after teaching all day, as we do. You know, you want a little time where this you, your voice isn't working. <laughs> so I know. get tired, of, get tired of the sound of my own voice, which is really funny considering I like this podcast, which is all about the sound of my voice. What? But <laughs> anyways, I I was saying to you that I always like to start these podcasts with like when I met somebody, if I've met them before, and I've already spoken on this podcast about when I met you with Amy Matthews because she was there. Mm-hmm. And it was at um, Jiva Mukti on Lafayette, and it was like an afternoon class at like 2 p.m. And I always wondered, you know, how, how you got that gig. Like how, how did you come to be at Jiva Mukti of all places? You knew Sharon and David, I think, right? I did. Well, I knew um, Leslie Kamenoff, and that was the, uh, a link because of uh, our common uh, friendship with Jessica Char. And so, I see. And but wait, because didn't you? I mean, didn't you tell me that you guys didn't exactly get along at first, you and Leslie? But like, he hooked you up with a class still. Like, how did that happen? We totally got along. He, I stayed in his apartment, and um, we were friends. And he, um, he, he had some kind of association with with Jeeva Mukti. 
So it's, right, he knew them because he we I talked with him recently, and he taught at the the Second Avenue Center before they were at Lafayette. So he knew them from way back. Yeah, when. yeah. I see. So so what happened? So you knew you met Leslie through Jessica Char, yeah. and Heart of Yoga because you put out that book. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you stayed with him, and he hooked you up with like. Sharon David gave you a slot to teach some classes. Yeah, I did that book for Desika Char, The Heart of Yoga, and that was kind of my calling card to the U.S. And so, I, I yeah, I'd gone into New York a number of times because the publisher was in Vermont and the traditions up in a little town up there. And uh, so I'd come in and out of New York, and I was crisscrossing between India and Madras and New York with – my little um, treasured project uh, to put that book. Mm. I went to Deskachar and said, Sir, I, I spent a long time in India, you know, studying with Deskachar and his father. And at a certain point, I traveled further into the US and I went and looked at yoga, what was going on in the studios of US. And it was kind of shocking, and I went back to Jessica Char and I said, Sir, are you aware of what the Americans are doing in calling yoga? And um, he was kind of aware because he knew what his uncle, uh, Mr. Ayenga, was doing up in Pune. But he wasn't quite, he, you know, he didn't quite see it all together. So I was doing like a, a world reconnaissance for him. And I go into LA and over to New York, and I, I was having a US experience, as, you know, having spent and a long, you... long time in India and New Zealand. So this was like an early um, foray in. And that was before that. That was before Heart of Yoga. So yeah. you weren't. Were you teaching classes, or were you just kind no, of like no. going to no, classes? I, like were you just sort of scoping it just out? Just scoping it out. I, I'd studied for a long time in Madras, and at a certain point, um, I went to the US. I don't remember exactly what brought me there in the first place. But I went into yoga studios and I came back to Madras and said to Desika Char, look, are you aware of what's going on? And he yeah. sort of was, but not really. So I, I right. made him aware and described exactly what I saw. And I, I said to him, like, sir, are you, do you realize that your father's teaching is not represented anywhere? It is just not there there's no book there's, it, that you can't access. <laughs> you know, there wasn't the internet where you could Google something. And, uh, mm -hmm. and he just said, he said to me, Mark, please, if you can do a book, please do it. Let's do it. And I sort of mm. took that on as a mission, and that was in like 90, 91 or something, and worked away All right, well pulling that book together, and then I went – back to the U.S. and found a publisher. And that's how I know she and when was the, I see. And when was, the, when was the book published? 95. 95. Yeah. All right. So that explains how you got to Jiva Mukti. Now, mm. can we backtrack a little bit farther? So how do you, how do you get to Desika Char in the first place? So you, when was the first time you ever um, like heard of yoga in your life? <laughs> I love this, Jay. Thank you. Uh, just as a young kid living in New Zealand, growing up in the suburbs, and the Beatles had gone to India, uh, ah. were in Rishikesh, and that was really interesting. So um, I became. So you were just like a you were just like a Beatles fan, and because the Beatles went to India and did like yoga stuff, that's that's where you got to first hear about it. Yeah, I would say I wasn't exactly a Beatles fan. I was more like English pop. I was more like the Kinks and the Rolling Stones. And the ah, <laughs> nice. <laughs> I, was like, I dig that. But, I was really into the Kinks for a while in my life. I really oh, like Kinks, that band. They're a good the, band. The Kinks are the most underrated. You know, they're the people's, the people's <laughs> music. But anyways, uh, you know, of course I love the Beatles. It was awesome. And so I was swept up in that scene as a teenager. And um, so, I mean, that's an early bit of our history in the, in the West of, you know, spirituality coming into the West in these late decades of ours. And it was certainly on the back of music 
and those brilliant young men who were kind enough to lay their life out to the public and say, you know, this is our interest, this is what we're doing. And those those images of them being in Rishikesh with the Mahesh Yogi were that awesome. that planted a seed. Yeah, that planted a seed in your mind. You're like, oh, India's got something there. Huh? Yeah, yeah. So, you know, so we would but be- wait. So I know you had like a whole life, like a whole career before you were a yoga teacher. So, so what? What did? How, where? Since from the time you you saw that as a kid. You went on and you didn't get to yoga then right away. You were doing other stuff first. So what did you do before you got to yoga? Well, I had a, I was a school teacher. I went through university, you know, diploma and teaching. School teacher? What, how, what grade did you teach? Young kids. I was hopeless at it, though. <laughs> really? <laughs> was it like just like general ed or like a particular subject it was, or something? Yeah, just general ed, you know, just being in New Zealand. It's called primary school, you know. Early um, childhood but you, but, development. But that my father, that didn't both pan. my mother and father were school teachers, and my father was actually head of a teachers' college. It was a big part of my life, so that's what I did. Mm. That's what I knew to do. And but being a school teacher didn't pan out. Uh, no, I I could not do that thing that you were asked to do in those days of. Um, disciplining children in, in uh, regimented ways and then stuffing their heads with academic. I wasn't, I just couldn't do that. And so yeah. I didn't do it. I sort so, of did it for a year, then walked away from it. Okay. And so what did you do after you were a school teacher? Well, it was those times, those days where uh, the Beatles were raving away with um, beautiful music and that was all going on. So, you know, I had noticed their interest and um, followed that diligently, and therefore so, I mean, became uh, interested in in Eastern um, points of view. Yeah. And so, after being a school teacher, what happened? How? Did, where did you do after that? Like, I mean, I know you had a family and stuff. So, what what did you do after being a school teacher? Uh, well, um, you know, my dear wife mother of my children and we were sort of roaming around the world basically you know going to europe when did you when did, when did you meet her oh early early on we yeah, was like 17 and yeah, we were oh hanging I out see. so you were with this, someone from the time you were yeah we were young 17 young and, kids together and when did, did and we huh. we went and, we went through university and uh, teachers college together and became school teachers together, but sort of dropped out together and went to Europe and went overland as you could those days from England all the way through Europe, through Turkey, through Iran, through Afghanistan, through Pakistan, India, Nepal. (laughs) These were awesome days. Uh, But in London, uh, you know, I saw Jimi Hendrix in London, for example. It's like the highlight of my life. There's nothing been better than that ever since. Um, wow, since. that was that was like some Shakti put, right? Yeah, Shakti put. I love that. <laughs> Definitely seeing <laughs> Jimi Hendrix, um, you know, at a place called Woburn Abbey in, in those days, in those heydays. It was very important, formative times. Uh, and that's why I say, like, deeply... Um, in the life and the lifestyle and everything that involved that, you know, that explosion of consciousness in in the UK and then later into the US. And so basically you and your wife were just like, you guys are hippies. You guys lived the hippie we, life. We were hippies, yeah. Not exactly like destitute hippies. What did you guys, what did you guys do for money while you were traveling around? Well, in India in those days, if you had five dollars in your pocket, you were a rich man. You, yeah. Yeah, it was, you could live in India for a long for a while, right? Yeah, with, without without much money at all. So yeah, I mean, that, and so when that's you... what we did. I was going to London and and just working and you know cleaning houses and cleaning windows and uh, huh. that that sort of living in Ladbroke Grove and <clears throat> living that. And like, were you guys like doing all kinds of psychedelic drugs and stuff and doing that stuff? Or what were you guys Do you want into? me to answer that question seriously? 
Yeah, like I'm curious. I mean, again, I don't know. I, I mean, you were a hippie. I don't know what it was like to be a hippie. I'm like a postmodern kid. I grew up in the 80s. You know, I don't. It was. A, I don't know what it was like. It was it, a deeply uh, formative time, and certainly the use of hallucinogenics, LSD in particular, and uh, marijuana and <clears throat> and psychedelic mushrooms uh, was definitely a part of um, the lifestyle back then. Yeah. And then going overland um, from London to India and the sort of the, the hashish trail, you know, experiencing mm-hmm. all of that. So, yeah. All right. So when did you start? To, well, I just think it's, it's interesting. It's not like that now. It's not like, I don't know, the psychedelics don't play the same role in our culture that they did at that time, you know? True enough. It was fairly universal then I, it always surprises me that it is kind of weird how, you know, the psychedelic experience is so referred to in the public, you know, in the common parlance of the U.S. You know, people are talking about LSD experience, but, you know, it's a class A illegal drug, but it's like informed the public of their a certain sort of orientation to life. And people say it was, it was it, psychedelic, man, you know. Um, <laughs> Well, it's certainly a lot of people who have had those experiences, and I think a lot of those experiences sometimes point to things that also are discovered in yoga practice. Yeah. 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 So how did you, when did you, I guess, when you're traveling around and you're in London and you're in all these places, when did you guys at some point start to settle down, or when did you start to find yourself with more of a specific yoga teacher or get more interested in yoga again? Yeah, <clears throat> there was no real settling down for me. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah my, my dear wife, Robin, was a great school teacher and she, we were living in the countryside in New Zealand. I had a horse you know, and there was certainly, <laughs> there was certainly psychedelics. You, you had a horse? I had a horse. You had a horse? Yeah. Okay. And I'd ride, <laughs> my, and my, my darling wife, was working as a local school teacher in a country school, and I, I was uh, chopping wood and and uh, carrying water, <laughs> and um, oh my god, <laughs> and growing a garden. And then I had a horse called Red Wing, and I'd ride this horse up and down the valleys and in the Maori communities uh, of of Aotearoa, and it was kind of idyllic. You know, we really did try to live that idea of um, you know back to the land. Um, you know, hmm. hippie farming uh, lifestyle sort of thing. Um, wow! And I, you, so, you went all the way there. You made your you made your own little commune, eh? Yeah, and but then, yeah, and as I said, the Beatles had gone to India, and it was all like, okay, <laughs> so very righteously sort of cleaned up the act. You know, like no more drugs, no more, you know, clean and pure vegetarian uh, life. And uh, quite obsessively took on, you know, yoga and meditation as we could gleam it from whatever influence there was around at that time. And, and, but and what like, was the influence? What well, was your first experiences uh, the, the great like when you're, at that time? It should help it be here now. There was a sort of a natural transition from the psychedelic experience to the, um, the, the spiritual experience one informing the other, I suppose. But it was quite naive at the time, but um, beautiful. So I can remember being on the front porch of my hippie household up in the north of New Zealand with red wing chomping apples next to me and reading Ram Dass's book, Be Here Now. I still tell him about this and how grateful I was. And it was definitely... Well, like, I recently I recently saw a picture of you guys, like, together, like, just recently, like, you saw him, is that right? Yeah. Yeah, we're friends. I see him quite a bit now, because I've hmm. taught, taught yoga in his, um, in his uh, devotional community. So that... Huh. So it was definitely that book was, was um, an influence on me. Uh, mm-hmm. And it was then that 
so we'd already been in India as hippies on hashish, you know, going having a, that Indian experience, and then back in the countryside, being um, psychedelic hippies, and then pure, pure, you know, back to the land and and doing granola, granola hippies, yeah, granola hippies, definitely, and back to the land with you know, uh, purity of practices and diet and. Uh, trying to do some yoga and meditating and all that sort of stuff. Uh, then uh, the call of India came strong because of probably because of the Ram Das book, and mm. definitely. And had you had children yet together? No. 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 Okay. No. So you read Ram Das, and you went to India back, and and what happened this time? What changed from your hippie? commune life in the country I should. how do we get from there to <laughs> I don't know what I was I'm, thinking I'm, I just should have stayed there man <laughs> you should have stayed in your hippie commune yeah, yeah I, don't know. I, I mean I don't know what I was thinking you know they put us <laughs> on the merry-go-round all this spiritual nonsense and th- there we were no. life was good no. but you know we were... but 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 it but it it's carried on. So what? So what happened? So why are you not there? Why? Why? What happened? Where? Where did you go? Well, we're still sort of there. It's still the basis of yeah. everything, you know. Like live in community on the land, pure food, pure water. Old people, young people, you know, children uh, in this uh, in a natural place is still the life. All I'm saying is that we, you know, I know. as we say, it turned out that the hippies were right about just about everything all along. You know, we should have listened. <laughs> yeah. Well, but a lot of those hippies turned into other sort of people later on. But that's like a whole other conversation. That is another conversation. I, and it's like, <laughs> you know, like that, it's still my view. Like, what happened? <laughs> who, who, why did you do that to yourself? Who cut you in here, yeah. you know? Yeah. All right. Well, listen. So, all right. So what So what happens? You guys go back to India again, and this oh. time you meet some other teachers, or what, what happens just, when you go back to India Just again? for the detail of the story, I mean, I was a very lucky young man because my wife was working and provided income for me to go back to India. And I lived in India for, I think it was seven months before she got there. And I hmm. traveled around all over India, meeting all kinds of wonderful, wild people, uh, meeting famous gurus and not so famous gurus, or you know, like who? Can you no, name some names for no us? Who did you meet? Known yogis and unknown yogis. Um, people like uh, Satya Sai Baba, <clears throat> and um, going to Shirdi Shirdi Sai Baba, the predecessor of Satya Sai Baba. Um, going to Ganesh Puri and meeting Muktananda, uh, the, the place of Nityananda. Um, mm-hmm. These were most significant to me at the time. And because they were, of course, Muktananda and Sai Baba were still <coughs> young men in those days. So, um, mm-hmm. yeah, and just hanging out on the, the riverbank in... Um, Varanasi <laughs> with the sadhus yeah. and the babas. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, but a, something hit me when I went to uh, to Tiruvannamalai in in um, South India, the the place of Ramana Ramana Maharishi in this the sacred mountain Arunachala. And mm-hmm. so I was spending some weeks there, and a young man came. And I, we became friends, and a, a fellow called Douglas Rosestone. And uh, Douglas has been a dear friend of mine ever since. And he was studying with Desikachar. And this was in 1973. So Douglas took me back. Uh, it's a three-hour drive back up to Madras from Tiruvannamalai. And I met Desikachar and Krishnamacharya. I also met... Uh, the Krishnamurtis at the, around the same the same time same same month I was there because and and how did you how did you go from how did you meet them? Uh, Douglas was close to UG Krishnamurti and was also part of the J Krishnamurti scene, 
So and I see. and so Desica Douglas Char, hooked you in. Yeah, and Desica Char was friends of both, and I saw way back then that Desica Char and the Krishnamurtis were uh, dear to each other. So that became uh, immediately of interest to me. So I got to know uh, the two Krishnamurtis. Um, um, mainly in Bangalore, actually, that they were teaching at the time, but they'd also come to uh, Adia, to the Theosophical Society in Madras. So I had and that. When you say, mm. I'm sorry, when you say you met them, like, did that happen simultaneously? Did you study with Desika Char first? And when you say you met them, was that just going and listening to them talk? Like, yeah. how did that how did it happen back then? Um, going going to the great big public forums of Jay Krishnamurti, thousands of people out in the evening air and being in his talks. But um, with Yuji, it was a little different because Yuji was always on the side of those talks and he'd have a little gatherings in people's houses. And, and that was when I first met Yuji at one of those gatherings in 1973. And I'm very, yes, I was at one of those. You were. <laughs> oh, well, this, you, 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 you invited me to one when he was in Manhattan one time, one of for, those little gatherings. For me, Jay, that's the highlight of our connection is you meeting Yuji and all that that means. Well, I mean, but, it was definitely an impressionable meeting. And, you know, it's interesting. Maybe we could say a little something about Yuji because I think sometimes I... I have such mixed feelings about yeah. him, you know, like <laughs> in the sense that like on one level, he, there's something so important about what he teaches. And I want us to talk a little bit about that because I think that's really informed what you teach, yeah. which does, I think, make it a little bit different than like exactly what Desika Char was teaching. But what what's confusing is like, I know, and you sometimes don't care about this stuff as much, but like his actual story, like what happened in his life and stuff oh. It's not actually a great model, like like what happened to his family and stuff. It's not a great story, you know. Like Being in his it's not like something life. I want. It's not, yeah, in his personal life, it's not like something I want to emulate. Yeah, but so as much as I can appreciate, like what he was pointing to, and sort of like the ferocity with which he pointed to it. Yeah, but on another level, I kind of like don't look at him as like a figure that I would want to like. I, I don't know, like that whole calamity thing. I, I don't know what I think of that. Yeah, either you point to me how many people you know who've had great lives you know the it's the thing yeah. about you know Yuji being a a young brahmin male in india um and just you know anybody anywhere look into any family there is great strife and tragedy is the social fabric of our world and Yuji didn't escape that in his early life i mean he was born without parents uh, and born, of course, he had parents, but his mother died almost immediately after his birth. I've seen photographs, by the way, of Yuji's mother, and it's just mind-boggling. It's so beautiful. Mm. And um, and he was raised by a uh, his grandfather, who, by all accounts, wasn't the the kindest of human beings, and. Mm. On, and all that spiritual arrogance of the theosophists and so forth, and Yuji was raised among those folk. And just that, he, you know, mm -hmm. that he had some tragedies in his life, is that his his wife died early and, you know, they separated and then she died, and it was certainly sadness. And um, yeah. one of um, Yuji's children ha was was lame. He had a handicap and he died early. So, um, I mean, I guess, sorry, sorry to interrupt, but I guess that my feeling, the reason I always felt weird about it is it seemed like there seemed to be this implication that this calamity had that was the sort of insight he had in terms of like into the nature of things and yoga was the reason why his family life fell apart. No, it was quite, you don't think quite that, that's not true. Quite unrelated. He, All right. Um, is that, oh, they, yeah. Sometimes I've heard it painted that way. Like no. it's almost like. Like to embrace what he's talking about means your life breaks apart, and I don't think that's I don't think that's what he was saying. Do you? Not at all. I mean, he was a very diligent uh, father. Actually, you know, he 
he and Jay Krishnamurti were both theosophists in the Theosophical Society, Jay Krishnamurti in a more senior position than him, but they traveled all over America. Yuji would go around all over America in a Greyhound bus from town to town giving lectures on uh, theosophy. And he did that, and he brought all his children to the U.S. Uh, for their health care and his, um, his handicapped son and uh, worked very hard to support his children and his, his boy who was, had the health issues. So, you know, he was just a typical Indian man, you know, doing his best to uh, survive in this world. So his particular story about coming into a state of, what you might say is um, a state of power or a state of freedom, um, isn't particularly related to the circumstantial aspects of his life. I mean, that's the whole point of UG. That there is no linear process to get there. In fact, there is nowhere to get. <laughs> you know, and, the, and it's just a poetic word where he uses the word calamity. You know, mm-hmm. it, it, in other words, that all the hopes and the, the structures of the usual human mind and, you know, hopefulness to get somewhere in some future place, some future state, be that described in spiritual terms or just, you know, worldly um, imperial terms (laughs) of a grand lifestyle that you build for yourself. Uh, All of this linear effort and struggle is the denial of the wonder that you already are. And that's what he means by calamity is that that just that whole structure of mind fell apart for him for him. And this, you know, this happens sometime after his um, his early family life and the difficulties he had there with his his wife's illness and his son's illness and his wife's death and so forth. It didn't the, the, it, his uh, what he called his calamity didn't have anything to do with the difficult life circumstance that he had that, you know, most people do have in their life, frankly. Sure. Yeah. All right. Well, so, but Uh, he didn't, he didn't teach any breathing and moving exercises to you, did he? uh, Well, yes, he did. Did he? So did he teach breathing and moving exercises to people? Was he like a yoga teacher? Absolutely. And as Krishnamacharya, oh. the great Krishnamacharya, the grandfather of modern times yoga, you know, the teacher of Iyengar, the teacher of Patabi Joyce, Krishnamacharya, said of Yuji, Yuji Krishnamurti was the greatest living yogi he had ever met. Hmm. So that came out of wow. So that came out of the mouth of Krishnamacharya, and me as a diligent student of Krishnamacharya and Desikachar, how could I ignore that statement? I wanted to know who who was this Yuji, and what was he mm-hmm. doing when you know, <laughs> what sort of condition was he in? And this happened way way back in 1973 to meet both Jay and Yuji Krishnamurti and B um, to see who he was who they all were. And I was deeply touched by the fact that these were serious people. They weren't yoga entrepreneurs. They weren't spiritual entrepreneurs. They weren't swamis. They weren't creating, you know, the the spiritual business of India. They were like serious people, serious scholars. I don't mean humorless. They had a lot of humor, but they were just serious dudes who were... um, working out for themselves and for their friends what it was to be a human life and what to do about it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's what Chase said. Chase said the same thing about Desikachar Char because Chase met him at Colgate and through Colgate, and he said that, you know, he had studied all this philosophy and it was all about, like, this is the condition you're in. And yeah. a lot of times it's kind of horrible, <laughs> but they never gave him anything like, what do you do with that? And he said, a desk was like, okay, this is right. This is the situation, but this is what you can do to help it. Yeah. Yeah. And that was so powerful. So you, you got the same thing from them. Absolutely. And, you know, I love all these men so much 
because they were sincere people. They were, as I said, serious people. I don't mean humorless. They were just good, good people who were researching the traditions of their own world and then working out uh, its implication to the contemporary life and bringing forth the great tradition into uh, contemporary life. And, of course, it was always of interest to me that way back I was uh, had the privilege of meeting um, the Krishnamurtis and Krish- Krishnamacharya uh, and have always um, brought the two together. Uh, for me, U.G. Krishnamurti held... Krishnamacharya to the fire of his own teaching, uh, and, uh, to the truth of his own teaching. And that, that is that there is, a, there is a yoga that is appropriate for each and every individual. And that yoga is each individual's direct intimacy, participation with life itself, with the power that is life, the power of life that is already given that is arising as a pure intelligence and uh, an utter beauty, that is life. And that there is no linear process towards some other future state, none. It is participation in what is already given. Uh, the power of this cosmos is arising as you and me, and that's just a fact. It's not a spiritual statement. It's not a, um, a hopeful statement. No. It's not even a poet- poetic statement. The power of this cosmos. But that, but is it that is that coming? See, to, when you say that, like I've heard you say that a bunch of times, and I, I, I feel that when you say that to be truth. Mm-hmm. But when I've also like gone on since the years after I met you and heard you say that for the first time, I've met many people and many people who've studied within the Desikachar family with Ramaswamy, and sometimes like not everybody's totally on the same page with that even when they study with Deskachar. Yeah, I know. So that, does that come more from Yuji, what you just said? Well, that's what I say, is that this Yuji held Krishnamacharya to the purity of his own teaching. And that is, yeah. there is an individualized yoga for each and every person that is their direct relationship with life itself, or reality itself. And this was the the dialogue between Krishnamacharya and U.G. Krishnamurti, is that, mm. you know, Krishnamacharya was toxified by the male Brahmin search and had, despite his good intentions, it was still in his teaching. And it's still in there. You know, you go to these young men like Kal or or even Dasagachar, but Dasagachar was a special case because Dasagachar was deeply influenced by both Krishnamurtis. So Hmm. uh, Dasagachar sort of like got that sorted. He backed off from that, you know, the toxicity of a a search towards a future state called enlightenment Hmm. or or God, you know. And Dasagachar deeply understood that that argument that you cannot realize God, that that cannot happen, <laughs> you know, that God is arising as this present condition, as this moment, as this body. You know, and a, a parents having a child for the first time have that experience, you know, <laughs> what is this arising? That's why I say it is, a, it is arising as a pure intelligence and utter beauty, and that is the condition that we're in. There is no getting to that. And this was the great gift from Yuji. There is no getting to it. You cannot get there. The, the idea of having to get there is the problem. If you are hearing this message, then you're listening to the free version of J. Brown Yoga Talks. To hear the rest of our conversation, please subscribe to Podcast Premium at jbrownyoga.com slash premium.